Let's all stand. As we always do um, when we serve the Pope in uh, prayer. Um, some may ask, why do you repeat certain things every Sunday? Um, I think as we continue our study of Matthew 6, we'll see it. Where the Lord said, keep on asking, and it shall be given. I know when you read it in the English translation, it says, ask, and it shall be given. In the Greek language, it's in what we call a present. It's a continuative. It's keep on asking, and it shall be given. Keep knocking, and it shall be opened. Keep seeking, and you will find. And so, it's part of that pray, prayer without ceasing. And so, if you're certain you want to continuously uh, lift up in prayer in this church, continue to pray for Sister Juanita, uh, pray for Brother Tim, I understand he had a fall, and uh, he's not with us today, and so uh, kind of hurt him, and I guess he's real sore and whatnot, he has to uh, see a doctor, so let us pray for him. Um, Brother Tim, Amen. Amen. let us pray that Father's foot is all right. Amen. 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 If he gets it healed, the Browns may, may be able to use your foot. Amen. <laughs> They're in trouble. <laughs> they need that foot. But uh, others, uh, you know, pray for my mother-in-law, still grief. You know, when you lose someone, it just doesn't go away. I keep telling people, I think about my mother every day, every day. And um, I was thinking the other day um, how uh, I never I never thought, I was sharing this with my wife, I never thought that I would have to um, conduct all my dad's business. I just never thought it would ever come to me. I was saying that, you know, he's in the state now, he doesn't, he doesn't know what's going on. And I just never thought I would have to do all this business, all this everything. But uh, it is what it is. And uh, I guess that's one reason why you better treat, treat your kids right, amen? Because <laughs> you, you might have to fall back on them. Um, you really need them. And so, but I'm just glad that I, I can I can do that for him. Amen. But uh, it's still something I just never thought I'd have to do. Um, let's continue to pray for um, people to be saved, people to come to know Christ. You get an opportunity first, know what the gospel is, and just share it in a simple way as possible. But sometimes we can just share our testimony, how we came to know the Lord. This is why we are here first and foremost. Um, pray for our country. As we were talking in Sunday school, I know sometimes we want to be super spiritual and try to distance ourselves from what's going on in our, our country, but it affects all of us. And I think we need to be reminded that we've been called to be salt and light in the midst of all of this confusion. And I just want to say, we should never be part of the confusion, but we should be able to add some clarity with the biblical mind, the mind of Christ, to all of this. And so this is my prayer for all of us, and it's what you know I really, really strive to do. So um, our country is in the we're, we, we're in a chaotic state. I'll just leave it at that. Amen? Amen? So let's just pray as the Bible commands us to pray. So let's go to our opening scripture, Psalm 32, 1 through 5. Uh, remember, serve me correctly, the Psalm of David wrote uh, after he had uh, sinned with Bathsheba and had been confronted by Nathan the prophet. And he said the famous words, Thou art the man. I love it in the King James. Thou art the man. And then David went into confession of his sin. So let's read this Psalm 32, 1 through 5. How blessed is he who transgressed and forgiven, who sinned and suffered. How blessed is the man whom the Lord has not revealed in me, and whose spirit there is of the sea. When I kept silent from my sin, my body was away from all my room all day long. For day and night, for day and night, I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt 
Heavenly Father, Lord, um, you are our God. We need to be reminded of the confession of Israel. The Lord is our God. The Lord is one. And we need to remember that um, out of all things, Jesus is Lord. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so, Lord, as we come before you today, we want you to understand that our prayers, they center around you. And you are the center of our prayers. And so, Lord, we, we acknowledge your greatness and your omnipotence and, and your omnipresence and you know all things. Lord, we, 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 we acknowledge that and we confess that before you today. And Lord, as we pray, we understand we need to pray that your will would be done just as it is being done in heaven. So, Lord, there are certain things that we ask of thee, but at the end of the day, Lord, we, we only bow to your sovereign will. And so, Lord, after saying all of that, Lord, we pray for Sister Bonita, Brother Tim, we pray for Brother Adrian, ongoing issues with the eye, we pray for Sister Tina, uh, ongoing uh, physical issues with the MS, and we pray for others today that may in grief, be in grief, and whatever the need is, we lift you up before the Lord our God today. And so, Lord, we pray for those who do not know the Lord. We pray that they will know that um, you can be for certain of what your eternity is. And if you know the Lord of glory, Jesus Christ, uh, that covers all of it. And so we want you to know it is confession, repentance of sin and faith in Jesus Christ. He died for your sins. He was buried and rose from the dead. And if we could grasp that through faith, God is the one who saves us to the uttermost. He saves us forever. It is, it is his work and not ours. And so we want you to know those things today. Lord, we pray for our land. We pray for the madness that seems to be gripping um, our politicians and our supposed political leaders. And so, Lord, um, uh, we pray for civility. We pray for calm. But, Lord, we know that uh, the world will never know this and see this unless we are the salt of the earth as you have called us to be, and unless we are the light of the world in the midst of much darkness. So, Lord, I pray that through us, the world can, can, can sense civility and, and rational thinking. And, uh, and even they don't know it, uh, a, 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 a clear biblical worldview. And so, Lord, we pray all of these things today. We pray for those who are absent. We pray for all who are here, whatever you need. We lift your, your requests up before God. Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Now therefore restore the man's wife, 
for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you, and you will live. But if you do not restore her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. That is the word of God. Amen.
Psalms 118 verses 1 through 9, and then we'll read Matthew 14, chapter 14, verses 13 through 21, Psalm 118. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Oh, let Israel say, his loving kindness is everlasting. Oh, let the house of Aaron say, his loving kindness is everlasting. Oh, let those who fear the Lord say, His loving kindness is everlasting. For my distress, from my distress, I called upon the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me in a large place. The Lord is for me, I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is for me amongst the, uh, among those who help me. Therefore, I will look with satisfaction on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. Amen. I'm going to hold on to that one. <laughs> Next, we'll go to Matthew, Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 through 21. Matthew 14, 13 through 21. Now, when Jesus heard about John, he withdrew from there in a boat to a secluded place by himself. And when the people heard of this, they followed him on foot from the cities. When he went ashore, he saw a large crowd and felt compassion for them, and healed their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This place is desolate, and the hour is already late, so send the crowds away, that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said to them, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, What have there? we have here only five loaves and two fishes? And he said, bring them here to me. Ordering the people to sit down on the grass, he took the five loaves and the two fishes, and looking up toward heaven, he blessed the food, and breaking the loaves, he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied. They picked up what was left over of the broken pieces, 12 full baskets, there were about 5,000 men who ate besides women and children. Thank you. 
chapter 6. We're going to read 6 through 15. I originally planned to preach all the way through 15, but as I used my notes this morning, I don't think I'm going to make it. So we can make it through 2011. We're doing pretty good for what I have to give you today. Once again, this is Jesus teaching in his Sermon on the Mount. And these are his instructions about how those who are of the kingdom ought to pray. So uh, let me begin reading at verse 5. And I'll read all the way through 13. And you can read 14 and 15. <clears throat> back to me. So the Lord says when you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Truly I say to you, you have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret shall reward you. And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do. For they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. So do not be like them. For your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then in this way, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. The kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 14, 15, read. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. May God's people say amen. Amen. Sermon number 17. This lengthy discourse often referred to as the Sermon on the Mount. As we have said repeatedly, the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus' definitive teaching regarding the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven deals with truth in relationship to God's absolute rule over all things in his creation. And most importantly, this includes his rule over the hearts and minds of those who belong to him. As a result of this, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount deals with how those who are of the kingdom should live their lives. It deals with how those who are of the kingdom should think and thus live in many different areas. As a result, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount deals with the prayer lives of those who are part of the kingdom of heaven, of those who have embraced Christ as their Lord over all things, their Messiah, their Deliverer, their Redeemer from all of their sin issues. So Jesus, he teaches those who are of the kingdom the pattern of prayer, principles they should have, when they prayed to the Lord. And Jesus began to address the effective prayers of those who are of the kingdom in verse 5, where he instructed those of the kingdom they were to never pray like the hypocrites did, the scribes and the Pharisees, who were extremely fond of praying loud, showy prayers. And they did this just to be seen by men to be those who are super holy and super righteous. Jesus taught the people that those who practice this type of prayer, they would never be heard by God. And so he says, instead of praying like this, he says to those who are of the kingdom, pray in secret, and your Father who sees in secret, he shall reward you. Amen. Then in verses 7 through 8, we studied those verses last Sunday. The Lord instructed those who are of the kingdom never to pray like the pagans and the heathens did during the New Testament period by praying in meaningless repetition. This phrase, meaningless repetition, spoken of in Matthew 6, 7, is one Greek word, the Greek word, vatalegeo. 
It means to speak sounds and phrases which are not real words. It means to utter sounds from the mouth which have no real meaning. It means sounds coming from the mouth which do not communicate. Any real information, they communicate no real ideals. If I just started speaking the phrase la 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 over and over, I would be saying nothing. For these are just sounds, which are not real words at all that communicate real things. And so the Lord says, don't pray in this repetitious, meaningless sounds that are not really words as the Gentiles do. The word Gentiles is the Greek word ethnicos. It was the word used to describe those during the New Testament period who had no connection with the true and living God of Israel, neither did they have any connection with the people of God. It was a word used to describe the pagans of the New Testament period. So the Lord says, don't pray in these repetitious, meaningless uh, phrases like the pagans do because they think because they pray this way, their false gods will hear them. So the Lord says in verse 8, uh, don't be like them, so do not be like them. For your Father knows what you need before you ask. Mm -hmm. And so the Lord was very specific that those who are of the kingdom, they were never to pray unto God using meaningless repetition, sounds which were no real human language at all, Words which none understood because they were not real words at all. And I really believe it is Bata Legale that we are hearing today. And these brothers who I really believe are in error, who are so-called speaking in these unknown tongue, private prayer languages. Well. These private prayer languages are supposed to be a direct hotline to God. It is said that because you pray these, these unknown tongues that the devil can't understand what you are saying, therefore he cannot hinder your prayers. And so I don't mean to hurt anyone's feelings. Uh, you know, I, I get no joy out of being called a hater because I know I will because of this. But Jesus is very clear. You don't need to pray in this way. Why? Because your father knows what you need before you even ask. So if he knows what you need before you ask, there is no need to pray to God in some mystical, magical, unknown formula. You don't understand it. Nobody else understands it. Because that's how the pagans pray. The Lord is very clear. Don't you do this. The Lord was also, uh, 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 he, and so he also now goes on to give further instruction to those who are of the kingdom, the pattern for effective prayer, the pattern for effective prayer, the model we are to use to pray effectively unto the Lord our God. And he begins this in verse 9, Matthew 6, 9. The Lord says, pray then in this way. In light of the fact that those who are of the kingdom are not to pray like the hypocrites do, love to pray loud, showy public prayer just to be seen by men, Matthew 6, 5 through 6. In light of the fact the Lord says, don't pray like the pagans and heathens who pray through these repetitious words which are no words at all because they think they will be heard by their gods. Matthew 6, 7 through 8. Instead of all of that, the Lord said, pray then in this way. First of all, through these words, pray then in this way. The Lord is clear that he never intended his people to merely regurgitate the words in verses 9 through 12 as is often done today. So he never, he never gave us this for us to just regurgitate. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. I'm not saying it is sin or error to speak this prayer word for word on certain occasions, but I am saying this was not Jesus' original intent. His intent was those who were of the kingdom to pattern their prayers 
after the model he gives in Matthew 6, 9 through 12. We know this because the Greek construction Matthew uses in this phrase, pray then in this way. First of all, prayer of the Greek word, prosikomai, and it literally means you prostrate yourself before God or to pray to the Lord uh, in the utmost reverence unto God. And this was shown in, 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 the, in the biblical period. And they would pray to God by falling on their face before God. And really what it did was it signified you were praying to a holy, righteous God. So the word there means prayer, but even more importantly, the Greek that Matthew uses, and I don't want to get too far into this, but he uses what we call the dative case. And he uses it as the indirect object. Now, in the Greek language, the dative case, if it's used as the direct object, it is a means of doing something, but if it's used as an indirect, ob uh, uh, an indirect object, it is the method or manner by which you are to do something. So if I say, uh, you, know, you, you, you know, you need to be baptized in water, it, 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 there is the direct object, and so water is the means of the baptism. But if I say, you know, uh, 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 you, know you, you, you need to follow a specific formula in this, then, then I'm talking about the means. If I said, you know, we, you, we, we need to baptize you, but we want to take you down slowly, now we're talking about a method or mannerism. In this case, the David is the indirect object, so the Lord is literally talking about the pattern or model of prayer that we are to follow when we come before our Lord in prayer. So he's talking about a pattern of prayer, a model of how we are to pray. And once again, I want to make it plain, it's not sin or error to repeat this prayer word for word. There are occasions that we, we do that, but that's not Jesus' original intent. Therefore, Jesus says to those in this verse, those who are of the kingdom, whenever you pray in secret to your Father, your prayers should follow this pattern, or they should be prayed to God in this manner. Let me say several things about this. Number one, as we read the Bible, there are various kinds of prayers. We read this in Ephesians 6.18 where the Apostle Paul, Paul speaks of all prayer. I like the way it's, it's translated in the NIV. It's translated like this. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayer and requests. There are different kinds of prayer in the Bible. We read of at least four of these in 1 Timothy 2.1. It says, first of all then, I urge that in treaties and prayers and petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men. So he gives us four different kinds of prayers. Number one, in treaties. In the King James, it's translated supplications. So when Paul says, first of all, then I urge in treaties, the Greek word is deesio. And it was a prayer that you prayed for specific needs. These are prayers we may pray when we as individuals have a specific need or request from the Lord. So these are specific prayers. Lord, I need this in my life. That is an entreaty. Then Paul says, I, I heard that entreaties, and then he says, prayers. <coughs> The Greek word there, prosuke, it literally means house prayers or prayers spoken in a house. We need to remember uh, the early church held worship service in where? Individual homes. For example, we're reading Paul's letter to Corinthians chapter 16, verse 19, that some in the church at Corinth, they met in the home of Aquila and Priscilla. And Paul said it like this, the church of the lady to greet you, Aquila and Priscilla greet you heartily in the Lord with the church that is in their house. Or in, uh, uh, in Colossians, read about some men in the, in, 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 in the house of a woman who lived in Laodicea named Nymphus. It reads like this, greet the brother who are in Laodicea and also Nymphus and the church that is in her house. So they had church in individual 
believers' homes. And so these prayers, it was really the corporate prayer, and they held worship service within the home. Am, am, am I making a little sense here? Yeah. Yeah. So this was a corporate prayer. It's sort of like the prayer that I lead everybody in when we are, when, when, you know, in, in our call to worship. It's a house prayer. It's a corporate prayer. It's a prayer that we all pray. Paul goes on to say petitions or intercessions that it reads in the King James Bible. The Greek word is intibusis, and these were prayers people prayed by gathering together for a specific reason. So there was an intercessory prayer. In other words, we're going to get together tonight, and we're going to, we're going to pray specifically for this and that. They're in trouble, and we are going to intercede for them in prayer. And then he also says thanksgivings. The word there, Eucharista, these were specific prayers of gratitude to God for his many blessings. And we can read on in Paul, because he talks about praying for those political leaders. They need a whole lot of prayer. Amen? Amen. So there are various kinds of prayer in the Bible. According to Jesus, all these different forms of prayer, they ought to be prayed by following the pattern. He gives to us in Matthew 6, 19 through 13. So whatever kind of prayer you are praying, some kind of way, we are to weave into it what Jesus teaches us in Matthew 6, 9 through 15. This highly suggests we must work at our prayer lives. Well, in order to pray in the manner Jesus prescribes. For we must give careful thought to our prayers in order to obey the Lord and pattern them according to the words he gives us in Matthew 6, really 9 through 15. You have to think about what you're going to pray. If you're going to follow this model, every time you pray, this seems to say there needs to be some kind of organization and structure in our prayers. If we're going to obey this pattern, that means you've you got to think about what you're going to say. This is probably a problem for some because they think anything that has structure and is organized, they think that is not letting the Spirit have His way. Let me tell you what letting the Spirit have His way is. Is doing what God says is what? Amen. <laughs> According to what he gives us in the word of God. That's, that's the Holy Spirit inspired the Bible. That's, that's, that's what we call letting the Spirit have his way. Yes. Let's do this thing the way God prescribes in the scripture. So that means sometimes we have to think about what we are doing up in here. You know, as I read this, I said, wow, I, 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 I need to reorganize how I lead us in prayer on Sunday morning. I need to make sure every time I'm up before you, in some kind of way, I, I use this as a model for our corporate prayer. Because we want to be obedient to the Lord. And we want to pray effectively under the Lord, our God. The truth is, when it comes to how we practice effective prayer under God, Jesus commands us really to have some amount of structure in our prayers, apart from acting like a robot, in order to make sure we pattern our prayers after his words in Matthew 6, 19, 9 through 15. However, this does not mean we are to avoid emotional, heartfelt prayer. You can pray this prayer with all the emotion God has given unto you. And some will do that. Because we all are different personality types. All of us have a different emotional makeup. All of us have a different emotional pattern. So when some pray, boy, they really get into it. Our Father, who are in heaven. <laughs> and it's almost like praying a sermon. There are others. Our Father. But see, emotions don't necessarily tell what's in the heart. Yes. So you can scream a prayer and not really mean it. Or you can speak it softly and really mean it. Or you can speak it emotionally and really mean it. Or say it silently and don't really mean it. What I'm saying is this does not limit the 
style or form in which we pray. But it dictates the manner in which we should pray. Number two, when we follow the command of Jesus to pray in this way or in this manner, that he commands us in this Matthew 6, 9 through 15 text, this has to be the most effective way to pray. When the Lord says pray then in this way, that has to be the most effective way to pray. When the Lord says to us, you, you, when you pray, it's a bad here. It's almost like he's screaming at them. When you, yes you, I'm talking to you. When you pray, pray then in this way. It has to be the most effective way that we can pray. And I say this because Jesus was God of very God and sinless humanity. Jesus was and is truly God and truly a sinless man. Jesus was and is one in nature with his Father, equally sharing every attribute of God, and he was a sinless man. When a man such as this says, when you pray, pray this way, that has to be the best way to pray. It has to be the most effective way to pray. Amen. Jesus transcends all things. Colossians 1, 15-7, he says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. When someone such as this says, when you pray, pray then in this way, it has pattern our prayers in this way. It excels all of us. You cannot get any more deeply spiritual in prayer than you can by following the pattern of prayer given to us by Jesus because he sovereignly transcends all things and all persons in the universe. He is the one, the scripture said, that literally holds this universe together. He's before the universe. He holds the universe together. It was by him and for him and through him. All things that exist, exist. So this one says, pray this way, you would do well to listen. Amen? Amen. Amen. Never let someone fool you into believing there is a more deeper spiritual way to pray other than the way Jesus commands in these verses. And this includes praying in some kind of unknown tongue. The Lord, and I'm not trying to be funny, I'm just preaching the truth. The Lord said, pray then in this way, our Father is in heaven. He didn't say, pray then in this way, la, 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 la. He does not say that. Amen. Pray then in this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Jesus' pattern of prayer, it is more spiritual than all of these faddish methods of prayer. A few years back, everybody was praying the prayer of Jabez. <laughs> Somebody wrote a book, Prayer of Jabez. And you go back and read it, all Jabez prayed was, Lord, give me that mountain. That's all they prayed. Somebody wrote a whole book on it, developed a whole Bible series study. <laughs> and people were saying, Ooh, Pastor, have you heard about this prayer of Jabez? It's a better way to pray. It's a super spiritual way to pray. A category rejected. Because no man, nor angel, and give you a better pattern for prayer that is more spiritual than the pattern Jesus gives us for prayer in Matthew 6, 9 through 15. Amen. Jesus is better than Jacob. Amen. Amen. Jacob's prayer was just one form of prayer. It was that petition prayer. It was not the model for prayer. 
all of these prayers in the Bible, they are, they, they, are, they, are, they are probably one of these forms of prayer, but they don't give us the model for prayer. They don't give us the manner that God prescribes us to pray. So I'm here today to tell you, if you're praying like Jesus, you can't get any better than that. If you're praying as he told you to pray, you can't get any better than that. You can't get any deeper than that. Amen? Amen. Some claim the way they pray is according to what the Spirit gave them. Pastor, I can't do that. I got to pray the Spirit leads. But that I say, the only way the Holy Spirit will move you to pray is according to what Jesus already commanded. Amen. Amen. So if Jesus says pray then in this way, the Spirit's going to lead you to follow what Jesus yes. said. Amen. Amen. I mean, does that make any sense? Amen. You see, beloved, the Holy Spirit will never move or illuminate your mind contrary to what Jesus has commanded us. Well, because the Bible teaches us the Holy Spirit only takes what belongs to Christ and gives it to Christ's people. We read this in John 16, 13 through 14. Listen to what Jesus said when he described the ministry of the Holy Spirit. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me. Why? For he will take a what? A mind and disclose it to you. The Holy Spirit only takes what belongs or is of Christ. And it's these things he gives to Christ's people. This includes Jesus, a pattern to break. There is no confusion in the Trinity or the triune nature of God. There's no such thing as Jesus said, when you pray, pray then in this way, but now the Spirit then told you another way to pray. No, he only takes the Bible and what belongs to Jesus, and that he gives to you. So don't tell me the Spirit led me to pray this way, when Jesus says, no, when you pray, you pray in this way. Amen. There is no confusion in the nature of God. There is one will. There is one way. There is one mind. Some ridiculous self-centered prayer by which you're trying to get your way through. You're trying to reap your season of harvest. You're trying to get all the blessings due you. Prayers are trying to make you look super spiritual. And you're putting this all on the Holy Spirit. And I'm here today to tell you the Holy Spirit takes what belongs to Jesus. And that is what he gives to us, those who are of the kingdom. And so Jesus says, pray then in this way. The Holy Spirit himself. He never glorifies himself, but he will only glorify Christ Amen. and take what is of him and disclose that to Christ's people. This includes Jesus' pattern of prayer for those who are of the kingdom of heaven. Know what the Lord says. Pray that in this way, our Father, who is in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be your name. In this verse, the Lord gives to those who are of the kingdom of heaven his pattern that they, listen to this, and we today are to model our prayers after, no matter whether they are a corporate prayer, no matter whether we're praying a private prayer for specific needs, no matter whether we're coming together to intercede in prayer for others, no matter whether we are giving prayers of thanksgiving and gratitude to God, <clears throat> all these prayers, he said, pray then in this way. Now remember, these are guiding principles of our prayer life, or the things which we should incorporate into our prayers unto God. This makes room for you to pray according to your own particular emotional and intellectual makeup, but still, you can be assured you are praying according to the mind of God as given to us by Jesus. 
This assures us we will not just be going through the motions when we pray like the religious denomination of robots by praying canned prayers. Praying out of a prayer book, or even worse, praying some new so-called fresh revelation from the so-called modern-day apostle, prophet, or self-anointed bishop. Now, if you give me the choice, I'll pay to pray the canned prayer before I pray the bishop prayer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm serious about that. At least some of the canned prayers, at the least they do have some scripture up in there. I don't know where this apostle getting this stuff from. Because what he's getting is often contrary to scripture. Amen. But this assures we cannot be like robots. You know, all praying the same. <laughs> same way, same tone. You know, a robot. But it assures us we can use our own emotional makeup, our own intellect. And we pray in a way you need to each one of us. But it still incorporates these principles of effective prayer. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And so in our prayers, we should remember and thus confess the fact that God is in heaven and his name is holy. We see this in the words, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Listen, the primary focus in our prayers is not us, but God. The primary focus in our prayers is not us, it's God. Primary focus in our prayers is not your wife, mm -hmm. not your husband, not your kids, it's not your grandkids. Mm -hmm. It's God. Yes. Amen. 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 The focus of prayer is God. Yes. That's why the Lord says the first thing you do, you need to acknowledge God. Yes. He's in heaven and his name is holy. Our prayer should first and foremost be acknowledging the fact that God is in heaven. And as a result of this, he is infinitely above all persons, all institutions, all things. In other words, when we pray to our God, we are never to bring him down to the level of sinful man. Amen. Come on, Jesus. It's so. It's so because God dwells and he transcends the heavens. Yes. You see, even though we pray our Father who art in heaven, we must remember the heaven that he's in, he made it. Amen. We must remember the heaven that he dwells in, he transcends it. He made the heavens, and thus he transcends, or is infinitely above the heavens in which he dwells. It lets us know when we pray to God, we can't bring him down to our ridiculous, foolish level. Amen. When we pray, we ought to never think that God is on our own level because he is not. Yes. He rules over all things, far above the heavens. And this is why his ways are not our ways, and his thoughts are not our thoughts, as Isaiah 55 teaches us. When we pray, we must acknowledge that God is omnipotent, or is all powerful, and that there is nothing he cannot do that is consistent with his holy nature. When we pray, we must understand and thus confess God is omniscient. He knows all things past, present, future, possible, and probable. There is nothing God does not know. And we need to recognize this when we come before him in prayer. When we pray, we need to remember that God is omnipresent. The presence of God it is in all places at all times. Amen? And that there is nothing that escapes his sight. God sees every square inch in this vast universe because his presence is in every place.
name, amen. God's name is holy because God is holy. This means that it's impossible for anything which is sin or imperfection to be connected to God. But this reveals to us that as God cannot be tainted by sin. But this is contrary to his holy nature. Because God's name is holy, holy, <clears throat> and infinitely undefiled by sin and imperfection. Listen, we must never pray foolish and sinful things before God. Amen. Amen. God is a holy God. His name is holy. And we need to recognize before we come unto God. He's not the man upstairs. He's your partner. He's not your co-pilot. He's not your pilot. He's none of that. He is a holy. I'm yeah. All knowing, yes, yes. everything at the same time, holy God, yes, yes. who cannot be tainted with sin, who cannot be tainted with imperfection, oh, yes. because he's holy, he does not tolerate any foolishness. Amen? Amen. Amen. God's name is holy. Therefore, when you pray to him, don't pray stupid stuff to God. Amen. What do you mean? Lord, can I just say this one time? <laughs> Stupid stuff. Lord, can I curse her out just this one time? And then I'll never do it again. Stupid stuff. Lord, can I have a billion dollars? Stupid stuff. You don't come before holy God with foolishness. Amen. Because God is holy, we don't come before him and cut up and act like we're out of our minds and start raving mad. Because God is holy. If, if, if the Lord would have shown here right now, you wouldn't be, you'd be on your face. You'd be fall as a dead man as John did when he saw the Lord in his glory. Remember he said, I fell like a dead man. The Lord walked up in there, you wouldn't be cutting up, acting a fool. Mm -hmm. Can't control yourself. <laughs> Rapping off in some words, don't nobody understand. <laughs> Hiding up in pews. <laughs> Running around the church. Cutting up. Acting frizzy. You know, and, and shook your wig off and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> You got a glimpse of the holy glory of God. Mm -hmm. The only thing you're going to be doing is on your face yeah. in fear of God. Amen. God is holy. Yeah. And we pray that we need to recognize that and acknowledge that and confess that first and foremost. Oh, yeah. Prayer is not about you, it's about a holy, righteous God. Yeah that we serve. Amen? Amen. In our prayers, we must remember and therefore confess that God sovereignly reigns and rules over all persons, all institutions, and all things. Amen. This is what it means when Jesus says to us, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When we say God sovereignly rules over all things, what we mean is God rules according to himself. Apart from the influence of any human, any angelic being, any institution of man, in other words, nothing sways God's actions to do or not to do what we want or what we like. God's will is being done in heaven right now. Yeah. Let, me, let me read that. Your kingdom come. I'm going to get to that one last. Your kingdom come, but the Lord says your will be done. Where? On earth. As it is being done. Where? In heaven. Yeah. You know right now the only thing that's being done in heaven is the will of God. Yeah. No human being is dictating what's going on in heaven right now. Amen. You're not controlling anything 
in heaven. You don't have any influence, not even that much. Mm -hmm. Everything that's going on before the throne of God right now that is surrounded by the angels that call the seraphim, Isaiah 6, 1 through 3, that cry out day and night, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. You have no sway up there. You have no juice up there. Amen? <laughs> You're not manipulating anything up there. You're not coming up before that. I'm here, Lord. Hmm. The things I need done. <laughs> you can't even control the car coming down the highway in your direction. Amen? Amen. You can't even control yourself. <laughs> and I'm talking about the simple things. Amen. Like a piece of cake. <laughs> I bought some white cake the other day. I tried to pick myself on some weed. You go to John Eden and get two nice pieces of white cake. Two nice pieces of white cake. So I got me one and I said, it's two slices like that, so I'm going to cut it in fours. I'm going to have one little block. With some coffee at the dinner. <laughs> and that's it. Now, I ate the one block, amen? Uh -huh. But I had a poke. <laughs> and I kept digging and digging and digging and digging and digging to about that much left in the corner, amen? <laughs> now, I can't even control myself with white cake. <laughs> but what cream ice? <laughs> But yet we think we can control what's going on in heaven. Yeah. God's will is being done in heaven. But guess what? The same is true on the earth. Amen. 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 Just as the only thing that's happening up there, wherever that is, is what God wants to be done, mm -hmm. same is true on the earth. Yeah. Father, your will be done. On earth, as it is where? Yeah. In heaven. But listen. Um, <clears throat> we tend to believe God can be swayed by emotional outbursts of prayer. Mm -hmm. Or many pray to God as if he's bound up by our sense of right and wrong. Our sense of what is just or unjust. None of this is true. In the same way God sovereign will is done in heaven, the same is true concerning his will being done on the earth. But just as none can manipulate what's going on in heaven right now, you can't manipulate nothing God wants done or not done on this earth right now. Amen? Amen. We need to remember this when we pray. In other words, we send up our request before God, but it's always undergirded with, Lord, your will be done. Amen. Prayer is more about finding out what God's will is for you than you getting what you want to get done, uh, God doing what you want to get done. Amen. 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 Romans 3.10, there is none righteous, not even one. 
God responds to us according to his will, whether in our will, for our wills are taken by our sin, it prevents us from saying things clearly to the glory of God as God does. That's why I keep saying prayers about God. In the church today, the thing is about us. Don't be getting some stuff from God and God doing it our way. Got a lot of folks running around here mad at God because of this or that. He didn't do this for me. Well, first of all, you know, God does not exist to fulfill your will. Yes. You exist to fulfill His. Yes. His will is being done up in heaven, likewise on earth. Amen. Amen. Now, I think I'm in right here. Jesus says, pray your kingdom come. I didn't really think about that this morning. I had this one already, and I got it this morning, and I read, and I just got stuck there. He said, pray then, wait, let me read it, pray then in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. The first thing he says is, pray what? Your kingdom come. When we pray, pray to the Lord, your kingdom come. <laughs> In Revelation, John says it like this. I think it's Revelation 22, 20. John says the same thing like this. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Why would Jesus say when you pray, pray to the Father, the kingdom, come? In a sense, it has come. And in a sense, it has to. In a sense, the kingdom has come because those of us who know Christ are in God's kingdom. Those of us who have embraced Christ as our Messiah, our Lord, our Savior, we are part of the kingdom. And the kingdom is in us. And the kingdom has come from the sense that he rules over us because Everything down here is part of his kingdom. But in a sense, the kingdom has not come. So that's why we pray your kingdom come. Even so, Lord Jesus, come. Why does God say pray your kingdom come? Why does the Lord say pray your kingdom come? I'll tell you why. Because many things that we pray for will not be realized until Jesus returns in glory. And make all things right. Why anybody shout? <laughs> you see, beloved, God has already resolved all evil. Yes. He's already resolved all wrongs. Yes. He's already resolved all suffering. Mm. All pain. All pain. It was dealt with in the cross. Jesus Christ. See, we don't understand because we tend to only believe the stuff we can see and what we can feel. When Jesus cried out, it's finished. We don't know what that means. Everything sin brought on this earth, it was over. All the mess you see on this earth and the mess you see in Washington, it all goes back to Adam's sin. All of our problems, some kind of way, it all gets back to the fact that we are messed up, we are sinners. The cross of Christ dealt with all of us. Yes, yes. It's a done deal. Mm -hmm. It's over. Satan was defeated once and for all yes. on the cross of Jesus Christ. Yes. Nothing has been left undone that God needs to further take care of. That's why God is not working out no new way for you to be saved as somebody is lying to you and teaching. That's why Jesus is not up in heaven begging the Father, let me work out another way for people to be saved other than through me. <coughs> Everything is a done deal to the cross. The death of sin has been made in full on the cross of Christ. All wrongs have been righted. All evil has been eradicated. All 
suffering has been done away with. All pain has been done away with, but we will not experience the full effects of what Christ has done until he returns in glory. Amen. This is why we pray, Lord, your kingdom come. Amen. What we're really saying is, Lord, we understand that we're not going to experience the resolution of a lot of this until you come. Amen. Glory. All your questions have already been answered. But you're not going to experience it until kingdom comes. Why is there suffering? It's already been resolved. That's why we pray that the kingdom come. Because we don't see it all now. Yes. We don't understand it all now. We don't see everything that God is doing. We don't understand why God permits this or he does not permit that. We don't understand why God hasn't answered that specific prayer yet, although he has answered some. Not this one. Not that one. Not all of this stuff is going to be answered in the way you want, in the way we want, as long as we are here in these bodies flesh. Yeah. That's why the first thing that we need to pray before we start asking God for stuff is your kingdom. Come. As John says, even so, Lord. Come. Now, I know that some of us, because we live in the I want a now age, and I know that some of us, because we like, we, we want God to answer us the Burger King way. Have it your way. Yes, that Burger King. Oh, the lettuce of the pistol pickle. Special. Remember that? Special <laughs> Y'all remember that? Yes, sir. Y'all remember that? Yes, We like quick stuff. Go to the supermarket, line back up the giant eagle, and we hear you back there. Why don't you open some more gas? <laughs> I'm going to go try to teach you some patience. <laughs> so that body water, a line hung up that day. <laughs> Are you listening? No, yes. that, be, my, that might be where God made sure the line is all the way out the door today. Because <laughs> you are a child of his and you are impatient. <laughs> you don't want to wait for anything. Not even the cat. So he may have backed it up just for you. He may have made just enough people call along that day just so when you get there, the line will be back. Amen. And in the same way, wait on God. <laughs> we want everything out. It's not all coming now. All the questions will not be answered now. You're not going to get everything you prayed for now. You're not going to see all your requests fulfilled now. Matter of fact, most of them you probably never see them fulfilled because the stuff you're asking God for, it's not in His will at all. Amen. <laughs> It's some stuff we want to consume with this flesh to make us feel good and have our best life now. Mm -hmm. What Jesus is saying when he said your kingdom come is the best is yet to come. And in spite of that, we keep praying in anyway. But we pray in spite of the Lord, your kingdom come. Even so, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. Amen. Lord, this is what, Lord, I, really, this is what I really think I, I need. I don't know if I'm going to get it, Lord. Your will be done, oh Lord. Your kingdom come. Lord, I realize there's coming a time that every good thing from God I will experience then when I am known, when I know as I am known right now. Amen. Amen. Not going to get everything now, but we'll have it that one day when we see him. And when we see him, we'll be like him. But the Bible says we shall see him as he really is. Amen. Amen. And he is the beginning and the end of all things. And all things will be consummated in him. All the wrongs in your life, your 
That's what we long for. Yes. And we'll see them. Oh, yeah. Then that we behold the beauty of our Savior. Oh, yeah. Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And all the glory of his Father. Yes. God. I'm going to end it by just reading it to you once again. Pray then in this way, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Kingdom come. Your will be done on earth. And I'll pick it up again at verse 11. Amen. Amen.